Sounds good. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Especially, it's exciting for me because I have someone whose work, and I was just telling my guest this uh, just earlier, he's inspired me, he's challenged me, he's freaked me out, he's done the whole bit <laughs> with his work. But uh, Jerry Jenkins, it's an honor to have you here on the Storybox podcast. Now, for those of you that don't know who Jerry is, he's the author of nearly, get this, 200 books. I don't know. I'm still struggling to finish my first one, <laughs> but 200 books uh, with the sales of more than 71 million copies, including the best-selling book left behind the, the actual series, which was also adapted into a movie, which once again freaked me out. Um, Jerry Jenkins uh, has not been an overnight success and the the Left Behind series that he wrote was um quite later into into the process of him actually writing books but you're a, a new york times best-selling author of 21 books and i could go on and on and on but i'm i'm really excited to have you on the storybox podcast today jerry well thanks so much it's an honor to be with you thank you so much for making the time i we were just talking earlier about how you just had knee surgery um, and you've been recovering. Right. It's been quite brutal for you. So I appreciate you making the time to be here today. Love your enthusiasm. Um, before we dive into your backstory and how you became an overnight success, <laughs> uh, I have one question that I love asking all my guests at the very start, which is what does success look like for you? Well, you know, success is a whole different thing for me than for most writers, um, because I really was never called to write. Uh, I wanted to be a writer. In fact, I was a professional writer by age 14 because I talked my way into to being a sports writer for a local newspaper. And they paid me, this is back in the dark ages, of course, and they paid me a dollar per inch of copy that survived the editor's uh, blue pen. And uh, if it made it into the newspaper, I'd get a dollar per inch. So as a high school kid, even before I was old enough to drive a car, I was making $10 here and $12 there and, and learning how to write. And uh, But a, a few years after that, I felt a definite call at a camp meeting. Um, the, the, the speaker talked about um, that some people are called to full-time Christian service. And I really felt convicted there. And I thought, well, I guess that's the end of my writing career. I'm going to answer this call because I feel I should. I want to obey. And uh, I'll have to probably study to be a pastor or a missionary. And so I went forward and I, I talked to the, the speaker's wife, actually. She was really a wise counselor. And I told her what I just said, told you. And she said, don't be too quick to give up the writing because sometimes God equips us before he calls us. Mm -hmm. And you may be equipped with the writing as a vehicle to answer that call. Well, that changed my whole view of writing because, you know, as you know, most people who write books, they're looking for bestsellers. They're looking for big royalty checks. They're looking for great reviews. Well, I'm looking for those too. And, I, and I've been pleased to have, uh, you know, enjoyed a lot of that. But that's never been the goal. My goal has been to fulfill the call so just by writing the books, I'm obeying. And to me, success is obedience. And sales and reviews and royalty checks aren't up to me anyway. That's all in God's hands and in the hands of the market. And that really takes the pressure off me. I try to do the best I can. I want to be the best writer I can be, but not for the sake of worldly success, but to answer the call. You're the first person on my show that has actually equated success as being obedience. And mm -hmm. I, I love that. And I love how you mentioned the calling and you're fulfilling the calling in your life. Um, I, there's one, one of my favorite verses. I think it's in the Bible. I think it's in, in Corinthians, which talks about God doesn't um, qualify. I'm probably God qualifies the called. He doesn't, I think it's that <laughs> I'm, I'm stuffing it up in a big way. Um, let, I know it will come to me in, in better moment. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. There we go. <laughs> um, there go. yeah, that's, that's one of my favorite 
um, passages and it's very comforting even though I stuffed it up <laughs> a, a minute ago. But my, my question <laughs> to you, Jerry, is when when was – like how do we know that we have actually been called by God? Like is it just something, is it a feeling? Is it a sense of knowing? What actually is it? I think it varies for different people. For me, as a, about, I was about 16 when this happened. Uh, I felt under conviction when the, when the preacher was talking about, you know, some are called to full-time Christian work. He said, all Christians are called to serve full-time. But some people will actually make their living in ministry, and and it's a calling. And I felt, I mean, my heart was racing, and I felt pressure. I felt like I need to respond to this, and I felt this need to say yes or no. I could have disobeyed. I could have said, no, I want to be a sports writer, and that's what I'm going to do, and I'll try to be a good Christian on the side. But that wasn't what the calling was. It was a call to full-time Christian service, and so... That's how it was for me. I felt under conviction and I felt like I needed to answer. When was the moment for you that you became a Christian? I'm always curious about this. Like what did you grow up in a Christian family? Was it uh when was the moment for you that you realized that you needed Christ? Yeah, that's uh that used to be a bit of an embarrassment for me because I was raised in a in a Christian home and we we all went to church every Sunday and and uh, my brothers and I knew all the Bible stories and that type of thing. And uh, I remember as a t- as a teenager hearing other people's dramatic stories of salvation. Mm-hmm. And they would talk about having been in, in prostitution or drugs or alcohol or, you know, some horrible life. And then they were, they were you know, saved out of that. And I thought, wow, I wish I had a dramatic story like that. And I realized what a privilege it's been for me to not have to go through that. And to have been raised in a home like that, my mother actually led me to faith when I was six years old. My dad and my two older brothers were at a father and son function at at our church, and I was too young to go. And so I was playing in the living room, and and, uh, I noticed the painting on the the wall of Jesus knocking at the door. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that story. I hadn't heard that story from the Bible. So I asked my mother about it, and she said, well... It's symbolic, and I didn't know what symbolism was at that age. I'm not sure I do do now, but uh, she said that that door symbolizes your heart, and Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart, and he won't push the door open. You have to open the door and invite him in, and I wanted to do that, and so that's what I did, and that's that was the time. Now, I needed to rededicate my life as a teenager, and I needed to get serious about it and really know what it all meant. But I traced my salvation to that day at six years old with my mother. I was five years old and same same thing. My mom led me to Christ and I knew mm. like it was, I can't remember exactly what was going on. My mom can tell the story a lot better than what I can, but I knew that it was, I jumped on her lap and said, mom, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Um, and she led me through the 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 gospel um, message. And then when I was 10, when I could understand it a bit more, that's when I reaffirmed my, my commitment towards God. And that was my pastor at the time that helped me walk me through all that. Um, so I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing coming to know Christ as, as your Lord and savior. I remember actually calling my grandfather who wasn't a Christian at the time and telling him, Hey, Grandy, I just became a Christian. And he's like, that's, that's great. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> um, you know, like, and I was just all, all excited about it. Did you have that sort of feeling as well? Yeah, I did. And, uh, you know, I, I knew it was something special in our family and I was eager to tell everybody. And um, I, I had always been, you know, even at age six, I was pretty active in the, the church, you know, little kids group. Mm-hmm. And I remember, I think I was probably eight or nine, but, they chose a junior pastor and they, they chose me. And I'm not sure why uh, I wasn't any better than anybody else there, of course. But uh, I remember feeling really kind of proud about that and thinking this is, this is a great responsibility. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've just always loved church and the Bible and, and other Christians. And so I didn't go through one of those periods where I turned my back on it or rebelled or had to, you know, to, to, to come back. Um, as I say, I did I did do a good rededication as a teenager because I just wanted to get really serious and be bold in my public high school and share my faith. And so I've just really never looked back. Has your faith ever been tested? 
You know, I can't say that it has. Um, there are things that I don't understand. There are things in, in Scripture that I don't understand. Uh, some of the Old Testament, I, don't, I, I read the Bible through each year. And right th this year, I'm listening to it on tape, and I'm, I'm uh, going through it chronologically. And I'm going through those Old Testament stories where uh, the children of Israel offend God, and in his anger, he just wipes out tens of thousands of people. Mm. And there's all kinds of murder and mayhem in the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, part, part of me says, I can see why people are re repelled by this and don't want to believe in a God that would do that. And yet, I realize that's a side of God. It's not just a loving, graceful God. It's a just God and an angry God and a jealous God. And he is God and he is sovereign. And so I accept that. Uh, it, I wouldn't say it shakes my faith. It makes me wonder. It makes me want to study more and, and consult with more experts and theologians. Um, we've we've been lucky in our family, haven't seen a lot of tragedy. We've lost loved ones, but they, they were elderly and had and lived great lives. Uh, there are times when I hear about um, people who suffer, who are great Christians and missionaries and pastors, evangelists, and I wonder, you know, why do they suffer when I know lots of rotten people that it wouldn't bother me so much to see them suffer? But I, I leave it in God's hands, and uh, he says vengeance is his, and that uh, we'll, we're all going to face judgment someday. Mm. I, I've asked that question many times to many people, like, why is it that we suffer? And ultimately, like, if I look at my my own life and the things that I've I've been through, I'm only 24, and it's been a wild journey, crazy, crazy things have happened with not just my health, but areas of my life where I believe God has allowed it to happen. And, and ultimately it's been my choice to, to go down that, that direction. But then I shouldn't blame God and I, I shouldn't question his sovereignty or his, his workings in my life. I should say, what are you trying to teach me here? Like, Yes, I yes I suffered for a while, but it was my choice to remain in that state of suffering. Yes, it sucked, but ultimately God was still there comforting me. I just didn't want to see it. Like I could have turned mm -hmm. to him at any moment, at any point during those those times, and I could have asked him for help. And but I didn't. So that's my fault. Like it's not God's fault. And I don't think we should ever blame him. And that's sort of like the immediate response, like when we're going through a, a, a testing of faith. <laughs> like you look at, I love the story of Paul and how he had an affliction and he wanted God to remove the affliction from him. And God just says, my grace is sufficient for thee. I won't give you anything that you cannot handle. I just love that, that, and that picture of, whatever we go through in life, whether it's good or bad, everything is, is for us, you know? So I appreciate you sharing that, Jerry. It's good. Yeah. I found too that, you know, I, I sometimes um, am sympathetic to people who get angry at God and they say, why did you do this to me? Why did you take my child or why did we lose our home or whatever? And as I say, they might be very devout people, but on the other hand, um, I would be very slow to question God or be angry with God because I know down deep, having studied scripture, what I really deserve. And I deserve all the bad things that could happen to a person and really haven't suffered too many of them. Mm. Um, so I'm going to uh, just try to remain faithful and, and trust him. Mm. When in your life, Jerry, when you least expected God to show up in a big way that he has, and he's challenged you immensely. Well, I had an experience as a child that was really kind of strange. I was probably around 10 years old. And we had a tradition in our little tiny church that I, we attended in Michigan. Uh, on Sunday evenings, when the church service was over, the kids were not supposed to run in the sanctuary, but we would walk as fast as we could. And then we'd bound down the steps and race out the door and play tag and have all kinds of fun. And I always loved being the first one out. And I remember one night it was dark and the service was over and, and I ran out of the, uh, the sanctuary and burst out the door and I was running toward the parking lot. And I don't know how I had forgotten this. 
because my father had been helping with some of the construction at the church. And the parking lot had been dug completely away. It was 10 feet deep. It had bricks in the bottom of it. Um, for some reason, we didn't have construction horses at that point that we should have. I mean, it was, they were, you'd see them on the road, but there was nothing warning anybody there was a hole there because everybody knew it. And I'm running full speed toward this parking lot and I get right to the edge and I feel this arm stick straight out and catch me right at the, at the stomach. And almost like in the, in the cartoons where your feet go forward and your head goes forward and you're stopped. And I'm, and I'm set right back down and, I, and my eyes get accustomed to the darkness. And I realize I almost pitched 10 feet down into these bricks. And, and I look around to think, who, who was that that stopped me? We had one guy in our church, an, an old elder, who was from the South. So we forgave him for being a smoker, you know. <laughs> and he used to go outside and smoke. And I thought, well, it must be him. And I looked around, he wasn't there. No one was there. I believe God, just the arm of God, stopped me from killing myself that, that night. And uh, you talk about unexpected. It was hard for me to even talk about because I couldn't, I couldn't believe what had happened. But uh, that's probably the most traumatic experience I've ever had. Wow. Did anyone not believe you? Uh, I think there were a few who who said, "Oh, you just realized at the last instant and and stopped and you know skidded to a stop." Um, I know better, but um, yeah, there were probably a few people who were pretty skeptical about the story. I I can um, I believe you because something similar has happened in my life, and I won't go into what actually happened, but I will say that I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. Um, mm. I, I really, really do believe that God protects us. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so moving, moving forward a little bit, Jerry, in terms of you've studied the Bible, you know, a lot of the stories in there. Is there one that comes to mind that is sort of your favorite? Do you have a favorite? That's a good question. I don't know if I've ever been asked that before. I, of course, I love the David and Goliath story. Uh, always been fascinated by Jonah and the whale. Um, the the story of Joseph and his brothers. That's a that's a favorite of mine too. I'm not sure I have a favorite, but uh, and of course I love. I mean, I just love the story of Jesus. And uh, um, you know, my son has created this TV series called The Chosen that's become an international phenomenon. And uh, he's bringing to life the stories that I heard when I was a kid. Um, I remember being in the hospital for three weeks with uh, rheumatic fever as a child. My mother helped me memorize John 3, the, the meeting of uh, Nicodemus with Jesus at night. And uh, to see my son, you know, decades later, bring that to life on the screen was very moving for me. So I suppose if I had to pick a favorite, it would be the Nicodemus meeting Jesus by night. So your son was the one that started the chosen. That is incredible. That's correct. He's um, no, he created it. He's he's revolutionizing everything. Like ah, oh, that is cool. <laughs> that is so cool. I I, I have to speak to him. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, so where does your your inspiration come from to write so many books? Like. Do they come from reading other people's work, the Bible? Is it through prayer? Where does it come from? It's really, really a little bit of everything. Um, you know, the, the joke in our family, in fact, Dallas has said this to me. Uh, he thinks I've written more books now than I've ever read. And it's probably true. But um, a lot of people wonder why so many. And here at this age where most people are retiring, why aren't I retiring? You know, haven't I written enough and don't I have enough money, et cetera, et cetera. But that's never been the point. And the reason that I write so many books, and I, I don't say this with false modesty, um, I really believe that I'm mono-gifted. I have one gift. I don't sing or dance or preach. Writing is what I do. And so I feel obligated to, to exercise that gift. And where the ideas come from, I try not to analyze that too deeply. Obviously, I'm a believer, and so my worldview is one of hope, and I want that to come through, and that's what I want to write about. But as far as the ideas, they come from everywhere. They do come from reading, reading the newspaper, reading magazines, reading books, 
uh, now nowadays reading blogs and online, watching movies, watching television. Uh, I find that when I'm writing and when I'm making up stories, uh, things come to mind that I hadn't thought of for years, but all that seems to go into a, a resource area of my brain and it comes out when I need it. So that's where I get the, get the ideas. So you're, you're most known for, I guess, the Left Behind series, which was also adapted into a film with Kurt Cameron. I watched it as a kid and it freaked me out um, because of the actual subject matter. And I don't think anyone wants to, any Christian that is, wants to be left behind at the day of, you know, tribulation and judgment and all that. Um, but the way you did it, like, I still have those pictures in in my mind, like, poof, like, poof. <laughs> People just, like, go straight up into the air. I still got that in, in my mind. Um, so yeah. where, where did that uh, story come from? Well, that really came from Dr. Tim LaHaye. He's uh, in heaven now, but he was a, a pastor and a, and a speaker, a preacher, and he was a nonfiction writer. And he wrote lots of books about the end times and the rapture. And he, he noticed that though he was a best-selling nonfiction writer, it seemed to him everybody was reading fiction. And so he asked his agent to find somebody who could write this in fiction form, and that happened to be me. Uh, ironic that you mentioned uh, Kirk Cameron. I just saw him last night. I hadn't seen him for years. Uh, we were at a, a function of Colorado Christian University, and he was the, the speaker. And uh, it was great to see him. He's 50 years old now, hard to believe. But, uh, but the, yeah, the idea came from Dr. LaHaye, and he didn't want to try to help write it or anything. He just wanted to be the, the resource, the theologian, the scholar. And I'm none of those things. And so I was uh, happy to have him uh, standing by and he kept me on track theologically and he was a great cheerleader too. I would send him a hundred or 200 pages at a time and he would say, send me more. I want to find out what happens next myself. So it was, it was a great relationship. Which, which out of your 200 books that you have that you're the most proud of? Do you have one? I have to say it's one called Riven, R-I-V-E-N. And that comes from that great hymn about his Riven side. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just a, an idea that I had for many years and always wanted to write it. And about the time I was ready to, that's when Left Behind came out and I had to keep writing those, you know, one, one after the other. When I finally got the chance to write, write Riven, it just seemed to gush from me. And uh, it's my, my longest book. So even if you don't like it, it works well as a doorstop too. <laughs> but um, I was really happy with how it came out and how the, how the publisher uh, do the cover and that type of thing. So that's my favorite of all, all the ones I've done. It's also could be used as a weight. <laughs> exactly. Um, so what, what does it take? Uh, I mean, okay, let me ask you this one. So you weren't an overnight success at all. And in fact, you, you had a lot of books already out before you quite achieved the world success. Um, what kept you going in those those moments? Was it going back to your call? Did you ever think that you would be a bestseller? It really was uh, that to to just you know obey and follow the call. I I always wanted the books to sell more, and 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 I dreamed of having a bestseller. I had some some pretty good selling books that uh, may not have made the New York Times bestselling list, but they they made the Christian bestseller list and. Um, you know, I, I assisted Billy Graham with his memoirs, and I uh, I wrote a, a book about a famous baseball player here in the States that became my first New York Times bestseller. That was about my 75th book. So I had books that sold enough to, to make me some money and allow me to put my kids through college and pay our house off and that type of thing. So I wasn't a failure, um, but I would say I was probably a mid-list writer, is what we would call it. Uh, never dreamed. I mean, nobody ever dreams of a phenomenon like Left Behind or for that matter, The Chosen. I mean, my latest book is a novel based on The Chosen. Mm -hmm. And because of the phenomenon of the TV series, that book is going to do really well, too. And the irony there is that Dallas now is about the same age I was when Left Behind came out. And uh, so we're, we're both experiencing this uh, at, at similar ages. And I think it's good that it happened in our mid 40s. I mean, to, to me with Left Behind and to him with The Chosen, because I think it helps you handle it with a little more maturity. And we're, you're never sure what you're going to do with that kind of attention and that kind of income if, if you're much younger when it happens. So, how have you been able to handle that sort of attention? 
Well, mostly I, I try to remind myself who I am and who I'm not. And, um, and also, um, when you're raised in a Christian home, money is never the object. Money is never the point. And neither is fame uh, for fame's sake. It's okay to be known and appreciated for what you do. But to be famous for being famous is not, you know, something you should should strive for. And so when it came, it sort of came in an overwhelming way. You go from being somebody that a few people have heard of and appreciate to sort of a household name and, and just sort of ridiculous income and, and notoriety. And uh, what my wife and I felt was a, a burden to be generous. Uh, we wanted to make sure we were giving away most of this income and not, you know, just to, just to enjoying it for our own sake. There's a responsibility that comes with that. And um, we're really supposed to to consider everybody better than ourselves. And that means you help out people who need it. And we got to the point where we didn't need one dime more and we, we didn't need much of what we had. So uh, that's been a fun privilege too, to be able to, to be generous. It's also showing Christ. Christ calls us to help out the poor, help out the, the needy, that sort of thing. Um, yes. It's just showing love love of christ and i, I love it um jerry i want to ask you because i i recently completed my first ever book uh it's currently in the second stage of editing so the copyright stage has been a, an incredible journey to see god's hand in the book uh all through all throughout what do you what do you think in in your opinion, having written so many books, having having learned a lot of lessons, I have no doubt along the way, makes a a good writer compared to a great writer compared to a best selling author or that sort of thing. Well, writers are readers, and good writers are good readers, and great writers are great readers. So I hope you're a great reader. Um, I actually talk to people who want to write a book and they, they admit they haven't read too many books. And I think that's sort of funny. Um, you really need to be a reader to be, to be a good writer. Um, I think that uh, it's important to, to write a lot, read a lot and write a lot. Um, I also think it's important to exhaust your efforts to get your book published traditionally. In other words, where they pay you, um, you know, there, it's it's so easy to pay to have a book printed these days. And many people do that and they'll run up to me and say, I'm a published author too. And I'm thinking, are you really published or are you just printed and you paid for it? Because they'll, they'll show me their book or tell me the name of the publishing house and it's not one I recognize. And um, I really think people need to to compete and uh, and be vetted and, and have, you know, some editorial... Um, acumen look at their stuff and if if they try everything and exhaust all their efforts to be traditionally published and can't there's all, still always that avenue of, of you know paying to have it printed mm -hmm. um but it's a tough role when it, when you self-publish you're really self-publishing and you have to do everything a publisher does i've had people ask me you know with all those books you've written how how expensive was it to have them all printed i have no idea it wasn't my expense it was the publisher's expense uh, they pay me, not the other way around. That's sort of becoming out of favor. It's hard to do, and it's hard to to be the one who gets published by these traditional publishing houses. But that's something I try to to advise new writers too, because you need to find out where you stand really, and and make sure that uh, you've got a good editor and a good cover art and a good publisher behind you. Mm. Which, yeah, <laughs> like I was saying, I'll probably have to tell you later the story of how God sort of orchestrated this whole book. Um, but I appreciate you sharing that. It's, um, it's always great learning from some of the greats and especially the humble greats too. Um, Jerry, my, this is my second last question for you because I know your time is very valuable, but it's my all time favorite question. I ask everyone at the end. So I, it's a hypothetical one, but I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends and your family have decided to put together, not a book, but a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic for the sake of argument. But they've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Hmm. 
Well, I would want it to show that I was a, a good husband and a good father and a good grandfather. Um, that's more important to me than anything else in my life, um, you know, beyond the spiritual world, which of course is, that's spiritual too, because the only way to be those things is to have Christ at the center of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I recently celebrated 50 years of marriage and the kids are going to throw a party for us this summer. So we're kind of looking forward to that, uh, to see what they say and what they show, what pictures they show and that type of thing. But um, if if it says on my tombstone that I was a good dad, that'll, that'll thrill me. I love it. Do you feel like anything is missing in your life currently? I really don't. I, I, I feel just ridiculously blessed. And, uh, you know, there's people say, is there anything more you want to do? I hear about projects and I hear about people that I wouldn't mind writing about. Um, but I've, I've had so many privileges and, and been blessed so greatly that I certainly can't complain. Well, Jerry, it's been an honor actually speaking to you today and asking you questions. Thank you so much for your time, your your hope that you're giving to people in the world, your also humility. I think it's very rare to find someone like yourself with the amount of success that you do have that is humble. So I appreciate everything that you've, you've done for the world and thank you for coming on the Storybox podcast. Well, thanks so much for having me. It was an honor to be with you.